And I'm going to begin reading this morning in verse 4. Luke 2, 4. Joseph went up from Galilee to be taxed out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David. And he took Mary, his betrothed wife, being with child. While they were there, the days for her deliverance were fulfilled, and she brought forth her son, the firstborn, and wrapped him and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And in the same area, there were shepherds living in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. The angel said to them, Do not fear, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For to you is born today in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this is a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped, lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it happened, as the angels departed from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Indeed, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And hurrying, they came and sought out both Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. When they had seen, they publicly told about the words spoken to them concerning this child. And all those who heard marveled about the things spoken to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things, meditating in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as was spoken to them. Now, let's read from the beginning of Matthew chapter 2. It says, When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. But when Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the governors of Judah. For out of you shall come a governor who shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, inquired of them exactly what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again, so that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they saw in the east went before them until it came and stood over where the child was. And seeing the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And I'd like to share with you this morning about this topic, welcoming Jesus. Welcoming Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, we come to you in Jesus' name and we thank you for giving us your holy word. It's a lamp for our feet. And Lord, it's the light for our pathway. We ask you, Father, that you would send your Holy Spirit now and open our eyes so that we can see and that we can retain the truth that your word contains. Lord, we ask that our hearts might be good soil in these moments for the seed of the word of God. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, I don't think we would get much of an argument if I said that the Christmas story is probably the best known story in the world. There are very few people who don't know the story of Christmas, even if they don't follow the Savior whom we celebrate. It's a beautiful story full of fascinating characters and drama. But as people who do follow Jesus, our familiarity with Christmas carries a spiritual risk. We can move too quickly through the details of the story precisely because it is so well known. When it comes to reading about Christmas, if we're not careful, we might say, well, I know about all of that already. If we're not careful, we run the risk of not reading the Christmas story with the same care that we use in studying the rest of Scripture. I wonder if we treat it too much as a familiar story to listen to and not enough as God speaking to us through His Word. 
maybe we look at it as a story for kids rather than something that God wants to use to help us become spiritually strong adults. I'd like us to look together this morning at the characters in the Christmas story. And as we do that, let's invite the Holy Spirit to challenge us. Before we leave the holiday season behind, you know, Pastor Glenn and I like to say that this, this weekend, this is the cookie coma that we're in. We're fighting to emerge from it. Before we leave the holiday season behind, before you put all those boxes of ornaments away, and before the last cookie has traveled south from your mouth to your waistline, Let's see how we can welcome Christ Jesus into our hearts in a greater way. Because I think that's the need of our time, for people to embrace him, not in a sentimental way of the season or in a ritualistic way, but to fully embrace Jesus and his words, that we would welcome his power to transform people and become lights in the darkness. You know, Paul said in Philippians chapter 2 that we should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And when we think of that verse, we usually make that about our behavior. But Paul said there's a reason why we need to live that out. He said it's so that we can be the sons of God in the middle of a crooked and perverse nation among whom we are called to shine as lights in the world and hold forth to people the word of life. There's six different characters that we see here as we read through the Christmas story. And each one of them responded to God's invitation to welcome Jesus in a different way. We can learn from each one of these people. So let's look together at six different responses to the call to welcome and follow Jesus. I'm going to share them with you quickly this morning, and I would like to leave some time to be able to pray for people at the altar afterwards for healing. I believe that God wants to touch some people in their body today. So, But we're going to look at six different responses to God's call to welcome and follow Jesus. And the first one is this. Follow Jesus? No thanks. We already have a king. This was the response of King Herod. Herod represents people who have no room in their hearts for any king except themselves. They serve the unholy trinity. You know what the unholy trinity is? Me, myself, and oh, you know that. Me, myself, and I. And when he heard a new king was born, it says that Herod was troubled. He was agitated. Of course, Herod was agitated before he even got the message from the wise men. See, the Jewish people had never accepted Herod as a king because Herod was not Jewish. Herod was an Edomite, and Jews and Edomites were enemies. They had a very long and bitter history. There was a lot of bad blood between those two nations. And so Herod was very sensitive. He was always looking out for possible threats to his throne. And to say that Herod was vicious with people who got in his way would be the understatement of the year. Some of us have probably gone to a lawyer a time or two in order to prepare our last will and testament. Maybe you've even had to go back and change your will on occasion. Well, King Herod changed his will quite a bit for the simple reason that he kept killing the people who were in it. <laughs> if Herod saw you as a threat, he disappeared you, as we might say, no matter who you were. And that included rabbis who refused to say that he had absolute authority. It included his brother-in-law, and it even included two of his own sons. On top of all that, Herod also drove his wife to suicide. The Roman emperor, Augustus, who knew Herod, said, It's better to be Herod's pig than his son. We remember from the Christmas story that Herod was a butcher who had all the young boys around Bethlehem slaughtered in an attempt to murder the infant Jesus. And even so, in our day, there are still people who walk in the spirit of Herod, lashing out against Christ and against his people. This past week, we again heard tragic news of more bombings directed against Christians in Baghdad, where Canon Andrew White ministers. Canon White spoke here uh, several months ago, and if you were not able to be with us when he did, uh, I do suggest that you watch that on YouTube or listen to it on our website. 
And over three dozen people were killed in bombings by fanatics who want no part of the humble king of heaven or his followers. Like King Herod and like the men in the parable that Jesus told one day, their motto is this, we will not have this man, Jesus, to rule over us. Herod is a picture of people whose heart has no room for a king. They tolerate no rivals to the thrones of their hearts because they have already seated themselves there. As far as they're concerned, the position of king has already been filled. And maybe you've known one or two Herods, hopefully none who have resorted to actual murder, but certainly you have known some who will criticize you and discourage you from serving Jesus as your king. They want to murder your faith. Follow Jesus and you will be on the receiving end of their mockery because they have no room for Christ or his message. Society has gone in that direction. Maybe you saw, as I did, a cartoon uh, in the paper of, of a man and his wife looking at a card rack going through Christmas cards. And the man turned to his wife and said, hey, what's all this religious stuff doing on these Christmas cards? And the Herods of this world, you'll get that later. The Herods of this world might have refused Jesus as their king, but how blessed are you today if you have bowed your knee to welcome the Son of God and if you've said, he must increase, but I must decrease. So we can see that one response to the call to welcome Jesus is to say, no thanks, I already have a king. A second response is this, follow Jesus. He's okay, I guess, but change terrifies me. Jesus may be all right, but change terrifies me. Matthew says that not only was Herod agitated, but the entire city. He says Herod was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Why? Well, these were the important people, the wealthy, people who were the leaders of business and industry, people of noble birth, people with connections back in Rome. You know, even under a government like King Herod's, there are always some people, aren't there, that have a good thing going for themselves, and they don't want to see that change. Whether it's out of concern for their livelihood, or whether it's out of concern for their actual lives, people who were doing well under Herod were very happy to maintain the status quo. Bill Clinton might have said that change is good, but I'm sure in King Herod's time, King Herod said, change is dangerous for your health. Nice little business you've got here. It would be a shame if anything were to happen to it. We've all heard nervous thinking from people who fear change. People say things, don't they? Like, I can't change at my age. Or, I can't change in the position that I have. Or I've been a part of the system for too long to change. And we can imagine that people felt the same way at the possibility of a new king. I can't go and follow some new king of the Jews. It's too late for me. See, a new king would upset everybody's apple cart. What if there really were a new king? Would I lose money? Would I lose status? Change can be risky. Moving against Herod would certainly be dangerous. But what if Herod were to be overthrown? You know, the common people might seek revenge against the big wheels who had profited from King Herod's reign. Maybe the Romans would come in and ruin things for everybody. And so the news of a new king who was possibly on the horizon kept the people of Jerusalem on edge, wondering what change could bring to them. You know, when God calls us to welcome Christ into our lives, it can be unsettling also. It can take us out of our comfort zone. But don't be paralyzed, church, by the thought that Jesus says he comes to make all things new. Isn't it a part of human nature that sometimes we hold on to things for no good reason? Sometimes we even hold on to things that are making us miserable. It's just who we are. But God says in his word that he knows the plans that he has for us. Plans to give us a future and a hope. Plans to prosper us. Plans for our good and not of evil. And before Christmas fades away this year, I want to encourage you to entrust your life into the hands of a king who maybe does represent a change in some circumstances, but who also has the power to change your heart 
and to bring you every breakthrough that you need on the inside. How do we respond to God's call to welcome Jesus into our lives? A third response I see from people in the Christmas story is this. Follow Jesus, you go ahead. I already know all about religion. You know anybody like that? In Matthew's gospel, we see the response of the priests and the scribes. And this is a very interesting group of people in the Christmas story. They represent people who already have all the answers. People who say, well, I've already heard all about God before. You know, when Herod asked them where Messiah would be born, it says that they knew right away. They didn't even say, excuse me, King, could we have a couple of minutes to Google this? They knew what the scripture said. They knew right off the bat that seven centuries earlier, the prophet Micah had revealed that the Christ would be born in Bethlehem. So that was an easy one for them. You know, what's more significant and disturbing about their hearts, and if you were in our Wednesday prophecy class, you know this, Herod's Bible experts knew that the Messiah was going to be born soon. Many people who lived at that time expected the Messiah to arrive in their lifetimes. They had studied the book of Daniel, and they knew from the calculations there that Daniel's prophecies uh, said that Messiah would soon arrive. And here's the real tragedy. Although many of these men knew about the Christ, and maybe they knew those prophecies better than we do, it says that they made no effort to seek him for themselves. Their knowledge of him was theoretical. It was much more in their head than it was a matter of their hearts. Not even hearing the report of Jesus' birth could motivate these experts in the Jewish Bible to look for the Jewish Savior. We still have people that respond to God's invitations like this today. Who are they? They're the people who can't be bothered. They are satisfied. They've got just as much of God as they care to have. Thank you very much. Hearing that God is doing something new or hearing that God wants to meet with them in a personal way is not enough to get some people off the sofa. They've lost their curiosity and they have lost their hunger to know a living God. What a tragedy that is. All around us are people who have learned something about God and have learned about religion. Some know quite a bit, and yet they've never taken to heart what the Bible says, that God loves us and that God wants to know us in a personal way, that he can be to you and to me a friend who sticks closer than a brother. They don't know God as the one who said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. When God calls us to welcome Jesus, Let's be careful that we don't respond to that invitation by saying, well, I was raised in a Pentecostal church, or I was raised Catholic, or whatever it was, or I already know about the Bible. Church, I want you to know it's very possible to know the Bible and still be ignorant of its author. <laughs> Did you ever notice that the people who put Christ to death were the people that knew the scripture the best? Don't be one of those souls that Jesus was referring to when he said that God had hidden the important things of the kingdom from wise people and instead had revealed them to babies. Don't let your religious background or your education keep you from meeting Jesus today. What a tragedy that would really be. God is announcing to us that his son has come and he's calling us to welcome him. We're talking about six ways that people respond to welcome Jesus. And the fourth way that I see is this. Follow Jesus. He's awfully inconvenient. He's awfully inconvenient. There's a phrase in the Christmas story which has worked its way into our everyday language. We say there is no room at the end. Luke tells us that Joseph and Mary were put into a very difficult situation because of the census. Everybody had to go to their ancestral city, their family's point of origin, in order to be registered for the Roman census. Now, that may seem very strange to you and me, but in Jewish culture, that was just how a census was handled. I'm glad that we don't do it that way. Imagine, Mike, imagine if every 10 years when we took a census, all the Italians had to go back to the Bronx. What a mess that would be. 
But the result of the Roman census was mass confusion. Everybody was uprooted. Everybody was cranky and tired. We don't know who the people at the inn were. Scholars will tell us that this was not an inn like a hotel. This was not Motel 6. Now, in the story of the Good Samaritan, the Samaritan did bring the injured man to an actual inn like a hotel. But the word inn, which is used in the Christmas story, was something like a guest room in the house of a private person. In other words, it was not a commercial establishment like a hotel. So we don't know, but people have speculated perhaps this was the home of one of Joseph's relatives or Mary's relatives. But even though Mary was obviously about to have her baby, no one would give up any space for her in the house. So this is not a story, uh, as we imagine it many times, about getting to the hotel and finding out that the man has just flipped on the no vacancy light. That's not what's happening here. Because it was a private home, it's much more challenging to our hearts than that. It speaks about the possibility that we may be too comfortable to give up anything to let God into our hearts. We could be perfectly cozy the way we are and not be willing to be put out for anyone, even for the Almighty. In our day, sadly, many people come under that category. The pace of life causes us to think that we're too busy for worship. We're too busy to pray, too busy for God himself. May God help us not to see Jesus as an inconvenience. You know, at Christmas we sing Joy to the World, and we sang it this morning, actually. In that famous carol, we sing the line, Let every heart prepare him room. And this is how we need to respond to God's invitation of friendship with us. Lord, let my heart prepare room for you. See, Jesus comes to us, and Jesus is more than just a little garnish on your dish. He is more than just another event. He is not just one more activity to be added on top of a busy life. He comes wanting to be your very life itself. God invites people to welcome the Son, and we're looking at six ways that people respond to that invitation. Number five is this, follow Jesus, where can I find him? Where can I find him? Now we've come to some people who are probably a little bit more worthy of being imitated. These were the wise men. These were men who came a long distance, giving up a lot of effort to find Jesus. And because of their background, they were probably not Jewish people. We might be tempted to guess that the wise men were not really or shouldn't have been interested in what was happening that night. But we would be wrong about that because their desire to worship God, their desire to know God, it drove them to do what many people who were a little closer to home had failed to do. Who were these wise men, or as we sometimes call them, the magi? That Greek word magi, it means that they were magicians. It's where we actually get the word from. Of course, this is not a magician in the sense of, you know, David Copperfield or somebody like that. History tells us that they were the scientists of their day. They had been important officials in the empires of the Middle East, Babylonia and Persia. And it's possible that their predecessors, their forebears, were the Chaldeans that we read about in the book of Daniel. You remember in the story of Daniel's life, there was this group of Chaldeans who were jealous of Daniel and opposed him. Uh, Those were probably the predecessors of the Magi. Um, What were they all about? Well, it's common for people to say that they were astrologers. But When we say they were astrologers, I think that implies that they were totally given over to the occult and I'm not sure that that's completely fair. There probably might have been some astrology in the mix, but really what the Magi and others uh, of their kind practiced was a mixture of astronomy with astrology. By the way, I, I want to say that I hope none of us here today who names the name of Christ is, is practicing astrology. If, if you are a Christian, then certainly you should never be reading your horrible scope. When somebody asks you, what's your sign? You tell them, you say, my sign is the cross. (laughs) 
Now, in the ancient world, some people did try to formulate a true science of the stars in order to see what God or the gods were up to. If God was going to do something important, they said, well, he's going to put something in heaven to show me that something important is happening down here. And so, of course, people who claimed to be able to read those things were important in many cultures. And somehow the Magi did know that the king of the Jews had been born. Some people have said it's because of the influence of Daniel going back centuries that he had instructed them in, in a better way. But you know, astro astrology is dangerous because astrology is not about looking into the heavens to see what God is doing. Astrology teaches people that their lives have already been determined ahead of time based on when and where they were born. And so they say you have to be careful to follow the advice of astrologers. But you know, a Christian is never at the mercy of astrologers or psychics of any kind. Jesus said that he is the bright and morning star and he is the star I'm following. If somebody needs to hear this today, that Jesus can cancel, Jesus can rewrite any so-called destiny that people have spoken over you or even that you have constructed for yourself. Some of you know you wouldn't be too much today if it hadn't been for Jesus rewriting what others had said you were going to become in life. <laughs> Astrology and the idea of people having some kind of inescapable destiny does not come from the word of a God who gives hope. It comes from the hopelessness that arises out of following pagan systems of belief. See, we serve a God who says, behold, I make all things new. We serve a God who says if any man is in Christ, he is what? A new creation, a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things have become new because of the Son. So you don't have a destiny, quote unquote, to become what somebody said you would become. Whether it's your school teacher, whether it was a spouse, whether it was your mother or your father, and yet our kids are getting this idea of an inescapable destiny driven into them constantly. Luke, join me. It is your destiny. <laughs> no, you're not destined to become something that your father or whoever said. And you're certainly not destined to become what the stars are telling you. Christians don't follow the stars. Instead, you ought to follow the star maker. Yeah. Be like the wise men who said, we have seen his star. See, it was his star. And you know what? All of them are his stars. But how strange, really, how strange to me that men who had many more clues about Messiah than the Magi did could not be bothered to seek the newborn king, but these wise men with very little information pursued him from afar. Men who had studied what the word of God said about the coming Christ, men who lived in the very city where his throne will one day stand, they couldn't rouse themselves to seek the Christ, but men who hardly knew anything about Jesus pursued him. I guess that's why we call them wise men. They might not have known all those prophecies, but their heart was set on seeking. And when your heart is set on seeking God, God will reward you for that search. How can we respond to the story of Christmas? Have the heart of the wise men. It's a heart that is set on seeking God. God's calling us to welcome Jesus and follow him. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, seek, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy Upon him. Does it matter how unrighteous you feel or what you've done or how far away you are from God this morning? God invites you. He says, If you return to me today, I will have mercy upon you. It says, Let him return to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I feel from the Holy Spirit, somebody needs to hear this today, that there's some people in your life who will not abundantly pardon what you've done, but God will abundantly pardon you if you come to him today. Be a seeker of the Christ. Do what is necessary to make sure that you find him and that you gain him at all costs. Be like the wise men. Take whatever trip you need to take and follow that road wherever it may take you in order to find the one who is worthy of being worshipped. 
All right, we're talking about six different responses to God's call to us to welcome and follow the Son. And the last one is this, Jesus, let me tell you about him. Let me tell you about Jesus. The Bible says that there were shepherds out in the field. And you know, shepherds at that time, they were considered the lowest of the low. They were despised. Under the customs of that time, shepherds were considered unclean. And because of that, they were not even allowed to participate in many of the religious ceremonies. And although everybody benefited from the work that the shepherds did, they were outcasts nonetheless. Shepherding was one of the most thankless occupations. And if you were a mom, moms, you did not want your girls to fall in love with a shepherd boy. So I find it very wonderful against that backdrop. It's very wonderful that God disclosed to those humble and looked down upon men the big secret of that first Christmas night. See, he told those men what nobody else in Israel knew outside of the family circle of Joseph and Mary. And we could see that the hearts of these men were right and pure because their response was so wonderful. I see three things that the shepherds did that we as believers ought to imitate. And let's look at them very quickly as we begin to close today. Worship team, you can come back and help us if you would, please. Three things that the shepherds did that we need to imitate as followers of Jesus. First, it says they came with haste. They came quickly in response to the word of God. In other words, they demonstrated the same quality that many new disciples of Jesus would later show in the gospels that we read about. They moved out quickly in response to his word and they left everything to find him. We read about uh, Peter and his friends and his brother leaving their nets and so forth. And Matthew left his cash register to follow Jesus. But have you ever thought that the shepherds left everything, left all those sheep behind on that hillside? They dropped their staffs and ran to respond to the angelic message. You say, well, it was easier for them. After all, they had an angelic visitation. If we had angels show up, we would do the same thing. Would we really? I wonder if we really would. I hope we would. But it seems that sometimes, even though God has done some great things for us, we don't always trust him the way that we ought to. Many people, you know perhaps, have amazing stories of God delivering them and rescuing them time after time. And yet, despite all of that, they're not as devoted to God. They're not as quick to respond to God as we might think they should be. I pray that we would respond quickly whenever God speaks to us, and especially when God comes and invites us to know and follow and serve the Son. The second thing that the shepherds did was they told others. They told other people. These men were the first evangelists in the Gospel of Luke. And from everything that they certainly knew about King Herod and from everything they knew about the Romans, I'm sure they realized that it was a risky thing to do to go running around the countryside telling people that there was a new king in town. But you know why they did it? Because their hearts were gripped with a vision. They couldn't help themselves. The Greek says that they spread the news all around and they made it thoroughly known. May God give us boldness to make his good news known. Wouldn't it be wonderful if 2014 was a year known for evangelism? And if every servant, every follower of Christ had a determination, a fresh determination in this coming year to make Jesus thoroughly known all around the place. The shepherds said to each other a beautiful thing. They said, we have to make known what the Lord has shown us. If God has shown you something, or rather I should say, if God has shown you the someone of Christmas, then we need to make him known just like those shepherds did. And then we see that they offered worship. Third, they offered worship. They glorified God for everything they had heard and seen. They gave thanks for the message that a Savior had come to deliver them. And you know, they worshiped in faith, as we sometimes have to worship in faith, because part of that message was still for the future. The message was that Jesus would save them. 
that Jesus would rule as Israel's Messiah and Lord. You know, babies can't sit on thrones, right? And so that birth announcement was, was packaged inside the news that they were still going to have to wait just a little while longer to get the complete fulfillment of what God was starting that night. But God was saying to them, you hold on just a little bit longer and you praise me anyway because that fulfillment is certainly on the way. That baby would grow up and so would his kingdom. It would surely come. They magnified the Lord and they praised him that night. The Greek says that they were singing praises in honor of God. And I like that part. How many of you have run into some of the uh, Christmas purists that are out there? Have you run into any Christian scrooges out there, you know? Uh, they want you to know, though the Bible doesn't say that the angels sang that night. It says that they said. All right, maybe angels didn't sing, but you know who did sing that night? was people who needed God and knew that they needed God. They sang God's praises that night. And the shepherds singing songs of praise is a response that is so worthy of our imitation. And when you respond to God with worship, God will take care of your heart. His presence will come and he will keep you in his love and he will keep you in his joy all throughout the days and the year that's to come. Church, I believe that the light of the world, Jesus, the son of God, has come into the world and we've been summoned by God to welcome him. So this season, before Christmas slips away again until next year and you don't have to listen to Grandma got run over by a reindeer for another 12 months, before Christmas slips away, let's welcome Jesus. Let's respond to God's invitation as those first worshipers of Messiah did. Let's come with haste to worship him when he calls us. Let's live a life that gives him praise and gives him honor. And let's start telling people, let's commit. In 2014, let's start telling people once again that God has let you in on his big secret, that there is good news of great joy that will be to all people. And tell somebody that message. Amen. Come on, let's stand on our feet. Let's give Jesus some thanks and praise. Come on, give Jesus a big hand of praise. He's King of Kings and he's Lord of Lords today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, I want you to lift a hand and let's sing, O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him.